Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Gail, and I'm an alcoholic. I am not Clancy I from the sky. I hope you're not too disappointed. Um, They did ask if I would replace him, and I said, what an order. I can't go through with it. (laughs) Anyway, we just kind of bumped this talk up, which is great because you won't be falling asleep during it. Um, Can you all see the slides well enough, or do we need to turn down the lights a little bit? We're okay? Okay. That way you will have to stay awake. Um, Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, asking me to come to the Liberty Bell Roundup, which is held in the city of brotherly love. And I come from a fellowship of big love. So you put the two together, and this has just really been a wonderful um, trip for me. I was excited. I told everybody I'm going to Philadelphia. I taught fifth grade American history for 40 years. And uh, today, or yesterday, uh, thanks to my host, I got to go into Independence Hall. And um, I thought, um, I'm, I'm going to tell you how that ties in with our independence. Um, I know that when I was in there, I was thinking of the writing of the Constitution and how 13 states came together here and how um, the, their job was to unite 13 colonies. And I believe it was Benjamin Franklin that said, we have to hang together or we're going to die separately. And our very co-founder, Bill Wilson, when he was giving us the service structure of Alcoholics Anonymous, I believe was drawing from the experience here in Philadelphia. Because we have to hang together just like the early patriots or we're going to die separately. So, um, you know, it was just chilling um, to be here, and I got to go to Valley Forge, and um, it was great. We took a driving tour of Valley Forge, and while we were doing that, I thought, maybe I should come up with a driving tour of Akron so you can all put, like, a CD in the car and go to all the historical spots. So a little inspiration here from Philadelphia. Um, I definitely want to thank my hostess. Beverly, who picked me up very early yesterday and rode with me all day. And I want to tell you, you guys here really have to have some quality sobriety to drive in that traffic. (laughs) You know, you can tell a lot about a person's program by the way they drive. (laughs) And I want to tell you, Beverly, you are a model of serenity in a torrential rainstorm in gridlock and bumper-to-bumper traffic. So thank you for getting us safely all around town and being just a wonderful hostess. So If anyone sees her sponsor, please give her some kudos. Um, In fact, get this. She picks me up at the airport, and I could barely get into the front seat because she planted her big book on the floor. So I was already impressed with her. Okay, well, I'm here um, to tell you the story. You all share your story, and many of the speakers here will share their story. And I feel honored and blessed to be able to tell our story. Um, I bring to you greetings from Akron, where we just celebrated the 78th birthday of Alcoholics Anonymous. So happy birthday to you. We're still kind of young, aren't we? Um, And I like to qualify. I am an alcoholic, and if you don't believe that, a picture is worth a thousand words. Thank you. The grapevines asked me to give that as a centerfold, and I have declined. (laughs) If you notice on the the left, I have a half a gallon of wine. I'd like to tell you this is Woodstock. It's not, hello, Ben. Ben, hi. I didn't know you were an alcoholic, but I heard you were a heavy drinker on the tour. Um, And I have a deck of cards in my left hand and a cigarette in my right hand, and yes, my zipper is down. Um, I have a, uh, another picture uh, I'd like to share with you. Um, that's a picture of me in a blackout. Uh, 
and I'm happy um, to report to you that the lights came on for me uh, May 13th of 1978, and I am a, uh, thank you. Yay! <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. Um, and I want to show you what it's like today. Uh, I <laughs> That's for all the folks here from Texas. Uh, I, <laughs> I just did a conference down in Dallas, and I got to think, and I needed to add another slide, so I jumped on the hay, put the cowboy hat on and the boots, and said, take my picture, so you can see my badge there from the Gathering of Eagles. Um, I come to you and have become a storyteller in Alcoholics Anonymous because I was told when I got sober in Akron, Ohio, that whenever anybody asks you to do something in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're supposed to say yes. And so um, I've been saying yes. And now I was asked to see Lois Wilson and um, her companions at a Founders Day. You know, Bill used to come to Akron every year for Founders Day. He will die in 71, but Lois will continue to come. And so I was uh, seating uh, Lois and her companions when I met Nell Wing. And uh, I was seating her, and she began telling me that she was with Bill for, I believe, 18 years, a uh, constant companion. She was with him when he was writing uh, the uh, 12 and 12, and she just was a bubbly, beautiful gal. And I was so excited to meet her, and I said, Nell, if there's ever anything I can do for you, just ask. Well, I just want to warn you guys, uh, be careful when you say that in Alcoholics Anonymous, because they just, you just might get very busy, or what they say, active. With me, I kind of got hyperactive. Um, so anyway, um, I tried to do that. Uh, I didn't know exactly what it was, but I got involved in the... Uh, by the way, Nell was Bill's secretary and became our first archivist. Bill was concerned that our history would become myth. You know, a little twist here, a little twist there. So um, he asked her um, if she would start the archives, and uh, she became a wonderful friend uh, and companion la in later years to Lois. So, um, so I began to do that, and um, I actually got involved in negotiating the purchase on Dr. Bob's home back in 1984, held it in my name for six months, and then trotted off to New York and said, okay, now we have a place to put the house. Would you please train me? Because I had no training. I mean, I was a school teacher, um, re uh, and I was also a former librarian, so it sort of I knew what I was doing. But um, it's not easy to be an archivist in an anonymous organization. <laughs> Think about that, okay? Um, so uh, I thought, I, I was kind of excited, and I thought, well, you know, I'll put it in the house. We've got the house now, and that's why I went to New York. I said, we'll put it in the house. And uh, she began to share with me that if I wanted to be an AA archivist, that we can't own property. So therefore, the house would not be a good place for the archives. And for the next couple of days, I whined pretty well and tried to talk her out of our traditions. Um, I did decide to, um, at that time, leave the house, and I began to uh, wander, kind of like John the Baptist eating locusts. Nobody was real supportive back then. And I began to try and gather our history. Um, and in 1985, I did leave the board, and for 10 years, independently tried to preserve it. But then um, our office uh, invited me down. And today, uh, we, and I say we because it is under the structure of Alcoholics Anonymous, so you know how people like to collect big books. Well, you all have a big, beautiful red book there because it's a we deal here in, Ak in Akron. So come visit us. And uh, this is part of my um, trip to Stepping Stones where I got to visit um, Lois and see the difference between how, you know, what belongs to Dr. Bob belongs in Dr. Bob's home, like Bill's stuff is in Bill's home, but what he did for us at the office is in the office. And so here's a picture of Nell at that time. And, and, and this is a very, this is a hard picture to share with you. Um, I feel real humble about sharing that, and I want you to know I'm having a drink with Lois, and I am sober in that picture. But my hair hasn't sobered up yet. <laughs> It's still pretty unmanageable, but uh, isn't that awful? And it looks like my zipper's down a little bit there. <laughs> 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 Ooh. 
Okay, so I'm going to take you on, I told you I was a teacher, so I'm going to take you on a little field trip. I, it's only because when you come to Akron, there's so much for you to see. You could spend a good day there just or more visiting, and I don't want you to miss the Akron AA archives that is headquartered in our intergroup office. Um, and here we have a picture that we're going to talk about, um, and it's, it's called The Man on the Bed, and we made it into a stained glass window. And it took us a, a year to do it. There's a thousand pieces of glass in that window. And if you had come and visited us, you could have cut a piece of glass. We would have helped you with that. Or you might have thrown in your sobriety coins because that is framed with coins from men and women who normally would not mix. Uh, it's also framed in the absolutes. We wouldn't have taken him the 12 steps. We would have taken him the four absolutes, which I'll tell you more about. Uh, I call this Embassy Row. We have quite a few long hallways and rooms, and um, it's got big books from every country. Uh, we are in 170 countries now, and uh, any country that's published a book, we have their book there with the flag, and then when they visit, they sign the book from their country. Yeah, it's, it's really wonderful if you come. And then there's a poster at the very end there, and then that poster was given to me very early before we even had an archives. This beautiful woman from France came and she said, um, we have a poster from my group that was given to us by the first AAs in Russia that we'd like to have in Akron. So at the very end, there's a poster signed by the first AAs, and some of those AAs have been through our office now. Um, there's... Um, Tartans, where they took the, the Smith clan and the Wilson clan over in the UK and they blended them into fabrics that are called recovery tartans. So there's a lot of international history that's kind of exciting there too as well. Long hallways, I'm a teacher from A to Z. If I'm not there, there's a headset, you can put it on, sort of like Alcatraz. I got, I got that idea from Alcatraz. Uh, and, and, or somebody, another tour guide might be there as well. And it tells the entire chronological history. You can walk through the history of Alcoholics Anonymous and then enter into an inner room where many of the artifacts are. Uh, Sister Ignatius Rosary's there. We have the manuscript copy of Dr. Bob um, that uh, we'll talk about in this story. Um, you know, a, a book, big bookcase, lots of the early magazines like the Saturday Evening Post that I'll talk about, hands-on copies that you can take off the wall and um, actually read for yourself. Um, there's a gallery that just keeps growing with lots of um, portrayals of Alcoholics Anonymous and gifts. And then we have a lab. You see, paper dies, and we want to preserve this for the generations yet to come. So we clean it, we repair it, we deacidify it, we encapsulate it, we store it in temperaturally controlled rooms under, in acid-free folders and um, boxes. So we're taking very good care of it. Um, and we have a trained conservator who does that, and we train anyone who would like to be trained. Uh, and then if you'd like to visit us online, it's akronaa.org. Um, and we have voices from Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. So for those of you who like our history and would like to hear their voices, if you go on that page, you can hear those. <clears throat> and now for what you came for. Uh, the history of the writing of the big book, and I hope you appreciate my first slide. It took me six weeks in a PowerPoint class to be able to do that. <laughs> That one's for you, Lori. <clears throat> I want you to just sort of imagine what Akron might have looked back like um, in the very early years when uh, Bob's office was downtown. And um, we had a lot of friends. We weren't, you know, we, when we think of Alcoholics Anonymous, we had many, many friends that helped us along the way. And Akron was the rubber capital of the world, and it had these big rubber families like uh, the Cyberlings and the Firestones and... Um, we didn't have royalty in our country, um, and um, we, were, you know, we, we did not. We, you know, we were still upset with King George. So uh, we, I, but we had industrialists, and they were like royalty. Um, and this is the Firestone, uh, uh, Harvey Firestone's sons, and um, to his. Let me see if I can get that laser up there. This guy here, that's Russell Firestone. His nickname was Bud, and he was a very bad alcoholic. Um, you know, the family with all the money and all the power, I like to say all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put that kid back together again. They sent him away from treatment. The family did everything they could, um, but there was nothing they could do to save their son, and they had kind of given up hope on him. 
Um, our story is filled with, um, I call them slender threads. Um, some people west of the Mississippi call it seconds and inches. Um, but this is uh, Jimmy Newton, and Jimmy Newton got uh, was chasing pretty girls not too far from here, Massachusetts. He was a young luggage salesman, and he thought he was on his way to a singles dance, so he followed him into the hotel. But you know what? He ended up at an Oxford group meeting. <laughs> God can use womanizers. Um, <laughs> And so he ends up down in Fort Myers, Florida, uh, helping Thomas Edison develop property. You know, Henry Ford's on the other side, all these great guys. And Harvey Firestone goes down to visit his friend, and he takes a liking to Jim. And he thinks he'd make a really good uh, president of the company. So he brings him to Akron to groom him for that. And while he's there, he takes a liking to the family, especially to Bud. Bud becomes a good friend of his, and he sees, he even went away to treatment with Bud. Imagine that. Imagine going away for a month to try to help a friend and um, going to treatment with him, but it didn't take. And so he said, the Oxford Group's meeting in Denver. Would you like to go? And Jimmy said, agreed to go, and he turned the bottle over. uh, 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 Bud turned the bottle over to Jimmy, and they had controlled drinking on the train. And then on the way coming back, some of you might know who Sam Shoemaker is. Well, slender threads, Sam Shoemaker was on that train. And he got pulled into a train car. And back then, they called it soul surgery. And they pulled him in and he made a surrender. Uh, Today we call it the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when he got off that train, he didn't look the same. The family looked at him, and the lines on his forehead were gone. He began to treat the the wife better. He became a productive member of the company. And Mr. Firestone was so excited about that that it starts to remind me of the prodigal son story. His son has returned home, and he's going to throw a big dinner and invite all his friends and introduce the Oxford group, which was returned to first century Christianity, to Akron. And now this is royalty opening up here in Akron. So it was a very big deal. That's Frank Buchman. He was the founder of the Oxford group. And uh, that's where we're going to get most of our principles. And here's a newspaper clipping of them coming to Akron, Ohio. Uh, it, it, it was high society. You see, if you, um, if, if you, if the down and uppers went to the Oxford group. If you were down and out, you went to the Salvation Army. So all of our society is coming out to greet them. And here's Harvey, and you can see the gowns. You can see how formal it was. And they're going to um, throw a dinner in the newly opened Mayflower Hotel, Jan- January uh, 1933. And at that dinner, Russell Firestone will give testimony to his recovery from alcohol. That's important, that it starts with a drunk's recovery and a father's gratitude in Akron. To the left here, you see, oops, let me go back. Uh, To the left uh, is Henrietta, and to the right is Ann Smith. Because in the next 10 days, they're going to call, they're going to have what they called house parties. And they're going to have these meetings, much like we have an AA meeting today. They're going to have it in the morning, and they're going to have it at night. And Anne and Henrietta will get involved at that time. Now, there's a depression going on, and Dr. Bob's getting more and more depressed all the time. He's, um, you know, he doesn't have much practice. He's got kind of a bad reputation. They're foreclosing on homes. They're getting ready to foreclose on his home. And his family life is a mess. Henrietta is going to, and he's going to be in the Oxford group for two and a half years. He's going to join it, and he's going to be in it for two and a half years. He's going to practice all the principles that we have today, except for one. And in two and a half years, he's praying, he's reading the Bible, he's going back to church, something he swore he'd never do. He's doing whatever they ask him to do. He's attending meetings, but in two and a half years, he doesn't get sober. So Henrietta gets word from Adelphine Weber, and she calls her up and says, what are we going to do about Dr. Bob and Ann? And Henrietta says, I don't know, what's the problem? And she said, well... 
Dr. Bob's got a, a drinking problem, and, and he's, he's running into a lot of difficulties. And so this picture reminds me of what the Oxford group did and what we were doing in the early days. We would get up in the morning, and we would say a prayer, or they would say a prayer, and then they would maybe read a little scripture or read from a devotional, and then they would get quiet, and they would listen for what God had to say to them that day. And then they would pick up a pencil and a paper, and they would write down what they called their guidance. And then you did another thing, which reminds me of sponsorship today. You had a partner in the Oxford group, and you would call that partner up, and you would check your guidance to see what it was coming from, whether it was coming from the Holy Spirit or it was coming from your ego. And they would check you. That was called checking. Mm, the alcoholics didn't like that too much. <laughs> So I picture her here praying for her friend, Dr. Bob, what to do. And she does get guidance, and it's profound. This house here was owned by T. Henry and Clarice Williams. Um, and uh, he, what, I think he was, he, I think he's, he believed himself to be a descendant of uh, William Penn. Um, but um, anyway, uh, this is this beautiful Tudor home. He was a tire mold inventor who's lost his job because of Bill Wilson's proxy takeover fight for National Rubber Machinery Shop. And they were ready to lose this home because banks are foreclosing just like they are in our day and age. And they, they had to stop just short of taking this home because the banks had already taken so many homes. And so they considered this home God's home. And when Henrietta called and said, can we use your home for a special meeting for Dr. Bob, they agreed to do that. And today we know what took place there as intervention. But back in 1935, you didn't turn on your TV and see a show and see that. There was nothing like that going on. So this came straight out of guidance. And this is the living room where it took place. Now, in the Oxford Group days, they had a setup meeting. It was on Monday, and Henrietta called it to plan it, just like they do in interventions today. And she said, look, we're going to share, and we're going to share deeply, and there's not going to be any pussyfooting around. And that was Monday, and they called that meeting for Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Now, I don't know what they said as they went around that room Wednesday at 8 o'clock, what it is they shared, but when it came Dr. Bob's turn, there was a a pause, and uh, he looked up at them, and he thanked them, and then he said, now at the cost of my profession, I have something I want to share with you. I am a secret drinker, and I cannot stop. And they said something that may lead to why we're sitting here tonight sober. They said, would you like us to pray for you? And he said, yes, and they all get down on their knees in this living room, and they prayed for Dr. Bob. And it's going to be right after that, Bill's going to come to town. Henrietta will continue to pray for Dr. Bob every day in her morning quiet time. And one day she got guidance for Bob, and she calls up uh, 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 Ann, and she says, Ann, Ann, I got guidance for Bob. I got guidance for Bob. And Bob gets in his car, and he races down the street and pulls in at the gate lodge. And she says, Bob, don't touch a single drop of alcohol. keep it simple, right? Um, he was a little disappointed. <laughs> the two men are going to get together on Mother's Day weekend, 1935. Um, we just dedicated Dr. Bob's home this Mother's Day weekend. Uh, it is now a national historic landmark. So um, the, the uh, two men meet in this little, um, let me see, I can show you right where, right there. And, uh, you know, Dr. Bob didn't want to meet with him. I'll give this bird 15 minutes. And you know the story. Um, they're going to meet late into the night, and Bill will stay with us in Akron. And they know that they have to uh, get busy. And uh, if you want to stay sober, you better work with another drunk. Bill has found that out. By the time he's reached Akron, he knows he needs Bob more than Bob needs him.
And so anyway, I just want you to know if you visit Akron, uh, it's closed on Mondays, but most days out of the week, you can actually go into the little room where they met, and the wallpaper's original, the flooring's original, and it's a, it's a beautiful setting there as well. And so they make a call on a man who's tied down in city hospital. And Dr. Bob calls the hospital, and he says to the hospital, he's looking for another alcoholic. He's got a cure for alcoholism. And the nurse said, well, Dr. Bob, have you tried it on yourself? Um, This is the end of June. Dr. Bob really hasn't been sober very long, but they did have this guy, Bill D., that's the first man. They called him the guinea pig. He didn't like that too much, but they didn't know how to approach an alcoholic. But I think what's really cool is we're here gathered to, um, in Philadelphia on a weekend coming up. Um, they're going to they're gonna share their story with him. And on July 4th of 1935, he's going to leave City Hospital, a free man, to never drink again. So the next time you see fire in the sky on your Independence Day here in Philadelphia, group number one also started on that day. He's, yeah. Is that cool? He gives us AA on Mother's Day. What a gift to the mothers, huh? And he gives us um, our first group on um, Independence Day. But now they didn't take him the 12 steps. The book hadn't been written yet. What we were doing in Akron was we were working with four words. Honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Dr. Bob said those were the only yardsticks we had at that time. They come out of the Oxford group. But there's four questions that go with those four words, and we still study those words today. You can measure your behavior at any time just like that with these questions. Is what I'm about to think, say, or do true or false, right or wrong, ugly or beautiful, and how does it affect the other guy? So I bring you back to this house for a reason. Remember I told you that on Wednesday at 8 o'clock a prayer is said? They're going to continue meeting at this home. And they're going to form a little group. It's going to be called the Alcoholic Squad. Now it's the Alcoholic Squad of the Oxford group, so it's like a subgroup. Okay? And so the newly sober alcoholics, there weren't very many of them. This was a real slow go. But they were meeting there on Wednesdays at 8 o'clock, and this little group forms. Only they couldn't sit still for the guidance part. They were jonesing. <laughs> so I just can you just picture them? Can you just picture uh, they're detoxing and they're and the Oxford group's asking them to just be quiet for a half hour and listen. <laughs> you ever tried to meditate in your first week of sobriety? <laughs> so Dr. Bob would take them to the upper room of this home, and he would get the surrenders, um, and then he they would come down, and he was known as the um, prince of 12 steppers because he could really he could really get a surrender and then they would come back down and join the group and 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 there would be refreshments and there would be a literature table and much like aa today those oxford group meetings were very similar so that's what's happening in akron we are flying blind up until the book is written we do not know what who we are what we are we have no literature. We're using their literature. We're using their principles. We're meeting in their homes. We're burning cigarette holes, uh, cigarette holes in their carpeting. Um, and uh, we are going to stay with them for four and a half years until the end of 39. Now, I'm going to take you to the other stage. So that's what's happening in Akron, the alcoholic squad. Now, we're going to go to New York. Um, And this is Calvary Church. This is Sam Shoemaker's church. This is the headquarters of the Oxford group. It's stationed there. And in that area, there's the mission, and there's something called the Calvary House. And the Calvary House is holding Oxford group meetings. And after um, Bill and Lois are going to get involved in the Oxford group, and I'll take you into their meeting. I think it met on Thursday nights, and there's what it looked like at the time Bill and Lois were going to the Oxford group. Well, you know, Bill's had this great spiritual experience in Towns Hospital, and all he wants to do is work with another drunk. I think that's where we get primary purpose, coming straight out of his spiritual experience. And when he comes into an Oxford group meeting, he about knocks you over looking for another drunk. Well, the Oxford group wanted to be all things to all people. And so they kind of gave Bill and Lois the cold shoulder. 
And uh, what happens then is that they'll start meeting at Clinton Street in 1937. They will break away. And they're going to form a group in their home. And that group's going to be called the Drunk Squad. So you got the Alcohol Squad in Akron and the Drunk Squad in New York, or a nameless bunch of drunks. Now, Bill <clears throat> is either up or he's down. He's either rich or he's broke. And he's riding, uh, coming, making a comeback. And he's coming through Akron in 1937. And he's going to stop into 855 Ardmore and visit with Bob and Ann. Now, he had spent several months in 1935 there. So he's coming back to visit Bob and Ann. And they get to talking about what's going on between Akron and New York. And they start counting how many people are sober. Well, Ebby has drank. It's been very slow going. You know, they get a couple guys sober, and then they would go back out. So, and by the way, yes, <laughs> Lori, I did Photoshop Bill in on this picture. I needed a picture of all three of them, so I chopped his head off and put him in. <laughs> a lot of things I do are hokey, but you seem to love it. So they start counting noses, and... Um, they count 40 people sober. And uh, by the way, that should say 1937, not 47. And they're ecstatic. Something happens, and it's like ecstasy. And I don't mean the drug. I mean the feeling. And um, they are so excited that 40 people, and they realize at that moment that a light has come into the dark world of the alcoholic. And so they bow their head in prayer and thanksgiving. Now, if you know Bill Wilson, it didn't take long before. He's coming up with the idea. He'd been working on Wall Street. We need a chain of hospitals. We, and you know what? We need some missionaries. And, you know, we probably need some literature. So he's going to, now, now he's going to say this to Dr. Bob right afterwards. And Dr. Bob, he wasn't so sure about all that. Um, <laughs> That's good. That's really good. You know, Smitty, his son, used to say if it was up to Dr. Bob, A.A. would have never left Akron. If it was up to Bill, he'd have franchised it. <laughs> uh, so I thought, you know, I saw this picture up at a meeting the other night, but I thought you'd like to see the two co-founders and see how happy, joyous, and free they are in the pursuit of happiness. And uh, you can see that uh, Bob loves wild ties. And uh, he liked Argyle socks, and he and they both were from Vermont. What a cool thing! I think that had a lot to do with why those two guys agreed to disagree agreeably. They just got along beautifully, uh, were best of friends, and uh, never really had a fight. I mean, they might differ, but they compromised a lot, and I'm so grateful for that. Does it not show how we should be in service? And what if they hadn't? What if they hadn't gotten along? Would we have the unity that we need today in AA? And that's Ann Smith, the mother of AA. And you can tell she just wants to get in the background, right? And uh, there's Bob telling Bill to keep it simple, not louse it up. And uh, I just love to see the two of them. So. so what they decide to do is they've discovered something called the group conscience. It's a new idea that maybe the group knows more than the one. So they go over to T. Henry's home, and they're going to put it to the test. There you see the living room again. Now, you know, Bill was a bit of a salesman, so you got to picture this. <clears throat> He's going to say, we need a chain of hospitals, paid missionaries, literature to keep the message from getting garbled. Now, here comes Akron. The man of Galilee had no press agents, newspaper, pamphlets, or books. Keep it simple. And Bill's going to say, you know what? You can keep it so simple, you're going to have anarchy. There are alcoholics dying within gunshot of this home. Um, if, you, if you study and you read Bill Wilson, he never stopped caring about the alcoholics we weren't reaching. And he never stopped caring about... Um, Alcoholics Anonymous, and he didn't take it for granted that if we didn't keep the principles, we would survive. So um, he just kept taking care of us. So they put it to a vote, and um, out of 19 men, what with one vote over, it certainly wasn't unanimity, they send him back to New York to raise the money. 
So he goes back to the Big Apple, only, and he starts pitching the rich, only they're not too impressed. Forty drunk, sober, big deal. <laughs> well, we'd rather give our money to the Salvation Army or the Red Cross. Well, Bill was subject to depression and imaginary ulcers, and he started working up a pretty good one here. And he's at Clinton Street, and he's whining and carrying on, and he thinks he has another uh, uh, ulcer. So he decides he's going to go to the family doctor, Dr. Leonard Strong. Dr. Leonard Strong has married Bill's sister, Dorothy. He's the guy that puts all the bills to town's hospital, pays for a lot of golf, and uh, and and now Bill's trotting off to him to to tell him about this ulcer, but he really starts whining about how the rich aren't giving him any money, and you know what whining is? That's just anger coming through a small hole. <laughs> and so, um, so Leonard Leonard says something that changed the course of our history. He says, you know, he says, I think I know of a girl who is connected with the Rockefellers. And the next thing you know, he's on the phone with Willard Richardson. Can't pick a better guy. This is Rockefeller's best friend and spiritual advisor. And Richardson is a kind man, and he arranges for Bill to go up to meet at the Rockefeller office. I think it's on the 54th floor. And... um it, you know, Bill says in a talk that he gave in Texas, on what slender threads our destiny does lie. You know, one minute he's down and out, the next minute he's in the Rockefeller office. You know, one minute the business deal falls through, the next thing you know he's at the Mayflower, and then he's in the Portage Country Club. That's our wealthiest country club there. I just love Bill. He's just up and he's down. So <laughs> so he's up there, and they arrange for a meeting later that year in the office with the Rockefeller boys. Uh, uh, John uh, D. Rockefeller is not there, but Bill sat in the seat, right? He had just vacated the seat. That's as close as Bill ever got to him. <laughs> but he thought he was getting kind of close to the money, so he was pretty excited because they wanted money. They're hungry. I think it's really important when we study the story of Alcoholics Anonymous that we realize, and our co-founders thought it was providential, that this story takes place in a depression. You see, we come together. We come together when the times are hard. And so um, uh, they're hungry. They want money. They, they, want, you know, they want to keep doing this thing. And, and um, so there are all these newly sober guys. Let's see who was there. Well, first of all, the Rockefeller people. Um, we have Richardson, Strong, Silkworth, and Amos, and Chipman. And we have the alcoholics are Bill, Dr. Bob, Hank, who was the first guy sober. I'll introduce you to him in a minute. Uh, he was the first guy sober out of towns in New York. We have Fitz, Ned, and Dick uh, from Cleveland. But they haven't been sober that long. Uh, and uh, they don't know what to do. They're in the, can you imagine how intimidating it would be for a group of drunks to sit in the Rockefeller boardroom? Can you imagine this scene? And they're kind of looking at each other, and they're all kind of nervous. And then they say, why don't we just do what we always do? Why don't we tell our story? So they began telling their stories. And as they're doing this, Albert Scott goes, oh, my God, this, this is first century Christianity. And he says, gentlemen, up to this point, this has been the work of goodwill only. No plan. No property. No paid people, just one carrying the good news to the next. Isn't that true? And may it not be that this is where the great power of this society lies. Well, Frank Amos was an Ohio guy, and he decides to come to Akron to check us out and see what's going on, whether they should give us money or not. And while he's there, he finds out that Dr. Bob's a pretty good guy. When he's sober, he's a pretty good doctor. Now, I've had people debate this because they're coming up with new information, but I always try to go with conference approved. <laughs> so let's say they get, get that they, they propose $50,000 to pay off the, Dr. Bob's home, get that rehabilitation place, put Dr. Smith in charge, subsidize a few people, start a chain of hospitals, and get busy on that book. 
the paper goes from Richardson and he gives it to Rockefeller and Rockefeller says, somehow I'm strangely stirred by all this. This interests me immensely. But isn't money going to ruin this thing? And yet, I'm so strangely stirred by it all. I wonder what's stirring him. (laughs) I have my thoughts about that. I want to hear what goes on, but please don't bother me for any more money. Notice that he says there, I want to hear what goes on. We don't know that. We just know that um, he said, no, I won't be the one to spoil this thing with money. That is not what they wanted to hear. They wanted money. This is a hard one lesson here. So they took the 50000 and uh, so, like I said, that may be a little bit debatable, but um, I don't want to argue with historians tonight on this, but um, we believe that uh, they paid off Dr. Bob's house, and that uh, left them with $2,000, and they're going to put it in Rockefeller's bank, the Riverside Church. Now, Reverend Fosdick is the head of the church, and he is going to write the first uh, review for the New York Times on Alcoholics Anonymous's big book. Then they, Now, this guy was young, but this is the only picture I could get of him. At the time, they get a young attorney by the name of John Wood, who's also in the Rockefeller camp, and they're going to draw up a charter, and they're going to call it the Alcoholic Foundation. This is 1938. And they had trouble deciding what is the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic. And that's the first time that and does appear. Thank you for getting that. I don't know who got that, but I heard a little chuckle out there. Uh, so who was on that foundation? Well, Leonard, the brother-in-law, Richardson was there, Chipman was there, Frank uh, uh, Amos was on there, and Dr. Bob Smith was um, uh, on the board, and Bill R., who later got drunk, and Harry B. Bill is going to be on an advisory board off to the side. That's our little office. That was um, Hank and Bill are going to form a company to sell car products. And this is their little office in New Jersey. I am the closest to this office I have ever been. It's on 17 and William Street. Um, I believe they tore it down. I believe they're rebuilding it, and they're going to put an archives in it. So um, stay tuned on that. More is going to be revealed. Um, And they hired this darling little secretary. Her name is Ruth Hawk. She was a very, very good secretary. However, in this picture, which is in Pass It On, She's sitting at the table that Ebby and Bill met at on on that famous 12-step call. And um, the caption under the picture says, she didn't know what she was getting herself into. She thought she was being hired for a car products company, but she said she never saw any car products being sold. (laughs) Somebody was either passed out or down on their knees making a surrender. Um, again, that's another picture of the of the office and Ruth. And that's Hank. That's his, this guy had an idea a minute. This guy was a, you know, you think Bill was a promoter? Wow, Hank, it's his idea to write the book. And there's the typewriter that, that Ruth used to write it. And she got the five billionth copy of the big book in Montreal for our 50th. And uh, the really cool thing, let me go back here. Um, I had this slide up. Uh, I gave this talk in Toronto. I've been giving this talk since our Toronto conference, and um, it's sort of for me like the Rocky Horror Motion Picture Show. People keep coming to hear it at Founders Day every year, and I said pretty soon they're going to start dressing up as Bill and Lois and (laughs) Bob and Ann, and they'll start throwing pamphlets and and sobriety coins. And Anyway, uh, I knew the story well enough, and I knew that we had gotten these worthless stock certificates that we paid her with. We ripped her off one a week. They weren't worth anything. They were supposed to be worth $25, but they weren't really worth anything. Um, And um, little did she know that the book she was typing would one day save her daughter's life. And Lori was my roommate, and I asked her to stand. She had about 30 years of sobriety at that time from Chicago. 
And, and I have a lot of stories like that. Um, and I just want to say you never know what you're doing today. You might be a link in a chain of events that might reach to one of your loved ones downstream from here. Uh, you can see that typewriter at the General Service Office Archives. You know, it's funny, we have this one of these because they type the stories at Dr. Bob's house, and now when we give tours, sometimes there's kids with their parents, and they don't know what they're looking at. (laughs) Sure glad I don't have to use that anymore, I'll tell you. So there was a lot of influences. Bill didn't just cook this up all on his own. He had uh, become familiar with William James, and that inspired him in the writing of the big book, uh, Varieties of Religious Experiences, was a key book for all of them back then. Remember, we don't have a required reading list, folks. Uh, we don't get the conference-approved literature till 51. So the, the co-founders had books that they'd recommend that you would read, and um, what is the Oxford group was like a textbook for the Oxford group, and I have to tell you a story. It's a great story. Um, I was, uh, it was 1984, and I was at a uh, harvest festival behind the gate lodge on that property of the Cyberlings. And uh, I was looking for old AA books, and um, I there was a tent right behind the gate lodge and I went to the tent and I asked the guy in the tent, I said, do you have any old AA books? And he said, no. I said, would you have any spiritual books? And he said, yes. And so there was just a few little books there and it was a little blue book and I pulled it uh, up and I, it said, what is the Oxford group? And I thought, hmm, were we, is that the group we once were? And I found the answer when I opened it up. It said, R.H. Smith, 855 Ardmore, his book, Please return. I say the book found me. Well, I tried to get them down to a quarter, but they made me pay 35 cents for that book. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I did return that book. If you visit Dr. Bob's home, it's to the left of the fireplace where we have his books. Is, Is that a cool story? I love to tell that story. Thank God, huh? Uh, The Common Sense of Drinking by Richard Peabody really influenced it with the stories that were in that book. And, of course, a beloved book of Alcoholics Anonymous even today, The Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox. Both co-founders would have recommended that book. Um, And For Sinners Only by A.J. Russell was very important. And if you want to read those books, you're going to see that Bill probably stole a lot of his great ideas. And I I have to give Abby credit here. I happen to know that Bill wrote his biography before he wrote How It Works. And if you read Bill's story in your book, and you you can number every single step, every single step. So between Towns Hospital and Clinton Street, between Clinton Street and Towns, um, Abby pretty much gives him the 12 steps. Thank you, Abby. Um, So Bill's going to write There Is a Solution. And he's going to take it to, um, oh, and he's going to ask Ann Smith. He's going to write that, his biography, and an introduction. And then um, he's going to ask Ann, would she please write to the wives? Well, Ann just wanted to stay in the background. And uh, he never did ask Lois, and uh, she she wasn't too happy about that. Uh, I think she worked it out now and on years later. (laughs) And you know who wrote Chapter to the Wives, right? Bill Wilson, yeah. <laughs> so he, somebody didn't know that. I just heard somebody moan out there, yeah. Um, and so he gets another hot tip. This Eugene Xman is a religious editor for Harper's. And this was a big break, okay? And so he goes and he takes these three pieces uh, to... to um, X-Men, and X-Men reads them, and he gets pretty excited. Now, Bill had never wrote anything, and so he says, uh, oh, my God, Bill, this is really good. Um, Can you write more? And Bill goes, yeah, yeah, I can, I can. He said, well, I'm going to give you a $1,500 advance to do this book. Please remember, they're hungry. Bill's not working. He's a missionary, right? Lois is supporting everybody. Um, And so this was pretty exciting for Bill. And so, um, oh, here comes that slide. 
I think I'm going to be bringing Bill back from the dead. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. You're not going to believe it. I'm in Philadelphia, and I'm giving this talk on the writing of the big books. Of now me. then. He interrupted me. As a graphic illustration of how pain and fear and all of our worst motives can eventuate under God's grace for the best, I would like to, in a hop, skip, and jump fashion, tell you about the preparation of the AA book. Well, I was fixing to ask you to do that. See, I picked that fixing word up from Texas, that's why. <laughs> But you kind of jumped in there, um, so thank you. And I was telling him about Eugene Xman, and I, I was telling him about how you were offered that $1,500 and what a big deal that was. Um, did you ever decide to take that? A few of us stood for the proposition, well, this would be bad because control of our literature would be in other hands. And some of us, in a more self-serving way, and this definitely included me, we felt that the book might make some profits and some royalties out of which its creators could eat. And I told him how hungry you were, too. Um, so well, what, what, what did you decide to do? Some of us in New York considered the possibility of publishing this book ourselves. You know, Bill, <clears throat> you didn't have that many guys sober, and if you publish it yourself, nobody's even going to know there's a book. So what did you decide to do? So then we went up to the Reader's Digest and told them about our budding movement. And I guess we brandished Mr. Rockefeller's name pretty liberally, you know, as a close friend. He wasn't giving us any money, but he liked us. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what did they decide to do then? The Digest said, well, fine. When will your book come out? By now, it's the fall of 38. Oh, we said about next spring. They said, this is just the kind of story uh, that we'd like. We will do a piece. We'll put a feature writer on this. Okay, Bill, but you know what? Um, you've never done anything like this before. Um, you must have had a lot of apprehension. Um, did you? Who would publish such a book? Who could assemble such a book? What should go in it? Supposing it turned out badly. These, indeed, for us, were great and most natural fears. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Well, what did you decide to do? Did you get a plan? And then a plan came into being... It was thought there ought to be a text. It was thought these ought to be backed up by stories. And this text was, in the first edition, two-thirds of the stories came from Akron. Yeah, I'm really proud of that, too. Um, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But um, I see up there um, is the outline that Hank wrote up, because it was his idea. And we have a picture of Hank up there. Um, so what happened next? So down east, we began to peddle stock in what turned out to be the AA book. But we were peddling stock to drunks, $25 a share. The purpose was what? To feed Wilson and the gal who helped do the book and the promoter and the collector of the money. Yeah, Bill, I already told him how hungry you were. Um, so we see here that it says Works. Why did you name it Works Publishing? The title was chosen because there would be a lot more work, you know, after this. <laughs> well, then you and Hank came up with this idea for a prospectus to sell these stocks. And one-third of the stocks were going to go to you. And uh, one-third of the stock, because you were the writer, and one-third of the stocks were going to go to Hank, because after all, he was the promoter. And then you were going to have to sell uh, the other third to anybody that would listen to you, um, which was mainly the newly sober uh, 
members and a few of their friends. So how did you how did you pitch this? So in the prospectus, we totted up what the profits would be. Oh, I think we started in with something like a hundred thousand books, and uh, you know the first few carloads and. Uh, I think we got as high as a million copies. Well, of course, if they only cost 35 cents and you sold them for 350, it was it would be frankly a great rise in that $25 stock. Might go to a thousand bucks a share. We didn't put all this on paper, but it was a part of the promotion. Carloads, huh? Well, um, then you tried to pitch it to the early members, and how did that go? We would sell these 35 cent books for the sum of 350. We didn't indicate any other expenses, but that seemed a quite a margin of profit to the prospective stock buyer. And we pointed out that they couldn't possibly miss. Couldn't miss. Because, after all, the digest piece with millions of circulation. Million. In which they definitely would mention the new book, would simply move these volumes out in carloads <laughs> while this job was being done. In other words, people were asked to buy stock in a book that hadn't yet been written. <laughs> I think this is a world record for sheer audacity. <laughs> I bet they did too. So, what was uh, the response? Well, this was heard out in this country. Uh, that this ex-Wall Street swindler uh, <laughs> was contriving one of the greatest rackets known to the mind man. So what was the reaction, Bill? Well, when this motivation began to be suspected and became apparent, a quite a violent opposition rose up. And uh, what did you do about that? So then, we had only begun our troubles. Then the book had to be written. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you start writing the book? Well, I wrote another sample chapter and tried that on them. No stock purchases. Oh, God, that had to be so disappointing, Bill. What about the trustees? What were, what were they thinking at this time? The trustees were very dubious. Uh, they had no money at the time, so we were able to face them down and say, well, we'll separately incorporate this. And sure enough, by an appeal to the loyalty of the stockholders to the cause, but also by an appeal to the pocketbook, the baser nature, the money began to dribble in. $25 per bet. And I bet you were relieved. So now you could start writing the book. Tell us about that. However, we were reading a few of us. On I the already told them you were money. hungry, Bill. And little by little, the chapters were evolved. And we thrashed them around in the AA meetings, and we carefully checked them with Dr. Bob as they went along. And meanwhile, he had great pains and difficulty got stories largely from this town. Well, they, sir, were reluctant when they gathered around that dining room table. They didn't consider them ri themselves writers, and they were s just struggling with it. Thank God Jim Scott, who had worked for the newspaper, got sober in the nick of time and helped them. And meanwhile, you were like writing chapters and sending them to Akron, and then you were getting feedback, and then we'd send it back. So it was pretty much going back and forth. And then one night, you just got so depressed, and that would be the night that you would write the 12 steps. Will you tell us about that night? In short, here was AA at its worst, but under God's grace, coming up with something better. Maybe history will say the best. <laughs> and so the work went on, and I remember one night we got through the first four chapters, which were window dressing, and 
I was having an imaginary ulcer attack, and it looked like, uh, <laughs> uh, well, things were very gloomy. The stockholders were kind of, uh, you know, falling down, or the, 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 the meal ticket was getting in danger, and I was very resentful. And I realized, lying in bed there in Brooklyn, Clinton Street, that the book had to say what it was all about at some place. So I began to write, and out came the 12 steps. And you had already written these six steps that you'd gleaned from the Oxford group. And uh, when you looked at them, you realized that an alcoholic could fall through the cracks. So you expanded on them, and then you counted them up, and wow, you saw that when you were finished, there was actually 12. And you thought that was a pretty spiritual number, and we're pretty excited. And then the boys came over to Clinton Street, and you introduced those 12 steps to them. And what was their reaction? Well, when they appeared, there was a terrific uproar. And as a result of the uproar, again, the constructive came out. I had had a great spiritual experience, so that I had used God all the way through those 12 steps. Whoa, and you had some agnostics in that group. Well, what did they think? Our atheist and agnostic contingent said drunks don't go buy that. They're scared to death of being God bitten. This ought to be a psychological book. Really? Well, um, then uh, what did the religious people think? On the other hand, uh, the religious people uh, said that it should be a strictly Christian book, theologically speaking. So one had to sort of average these point of view. You know, and while you were averaging them, you said, wow, you didn't even feel like you were writing the book. You thought you were umpiring it. So, um, you know, uh, quite a d d discussion took place, and um, you guys finally agreed on God as you understand him. And um, that has been, a, a, you, t you called it a 10-strike bill. And that's the reason why so many people can come into Alcoholics Anonymous all over the world today. Um, do you think you had God's help? Sure, we must have had God's help. We never could have produced it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, would you sum up the writing of the uh, first part of the big book for us? So, this is the unholy way in which God nevertheless graced us in the days when A.A. was very young. And that's the first part of the story, Bill, but then you had to get the book published. Tell us about that. Well, finally the great day, our publication approached. We had pre-publication copies of the book made, circulated around for criticism, and with the last of our money, almost the last, we persuaded the printer that this was such a terrific venture uh, that uh, he certainly ought to accept a 10% down payment for 5,000 books, which were going out with the carloads, its first installment. So we paid him $500 for 5,000 books. Wow. Okay, and you sent those, um, you, you, you got a, prospe uh, a manuscript copy, and you gathered about $400 up, or well, anyway, I don't even remember how much it was, but you sent out 400 copies of it, that's it. And because uh, you wanted to know what the nurses thought of it and the clergy and the doctors and just in general um, what people's feedback was, and they were supposed to write in it and send it back to you. Um, some of the feedback that you got was um, somebody suggested that you put in the doctor's opinion. So you asked your doctor, Dr. Silkworth, to write the doctor's opinion. And... Uh, on the screen, uh, we just recently uh, have um, we have that copy of that published because when they began to come back, you got a working copy of that. And boy, there was a lot of corrections. They told you to take the Oxfordizing out, and um, uh, you had to cross out um, a lot of I's and put in we, and you took Y-O-U-R and uh, took the Y off, and... Um, there was just so many corrections um, that it really kind of went through a whole other consciousness. And uh, we can study that book today. It's pretty exciting for us to be able to see what you went through. And it was such a mess that poor Ruthie did not want to get back on that typewriter and type that up again. <laughs> 
And so you and Hank and Ruthie and Clarence Snyder's wife, Dorothy, all accompanied that manuscript up to Cornwall and actually typeset it yourself. Um, and uh, what to call it? Boy, that, that game, you said, went on for, wow, about a year in AA. And um, you were going to call it the 100 Men Corporation. <laughs> Ladies, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, we can thank Florence Rankin, who got sober in the nick of time. And she says, you can't call it a 100 Men Corporation. you got to call it a 100 Men and One Woman. <laughs> It's true. And, of course, Bill, you wanted to call it the Bill W. Movement. Well, I already told him about the alcoholic squad and the nameless bunch of drunks. Dry Frontiers was considered empty glass and the way out. Or anonymous alcoholics. So Joe Warden gets sober in the nick of time, slender threads, and he's at Clinton Street. And he's mumbling in the corner, and he's gone, anonymous alcoholics, anonymous alcoholics. Then he switched it, and it became Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill, what did you think about that? We'd been calling ourselves out there a nameless bunch of drunks, and from that the anonymity idea had come in. In fact, the, the book title, as voted by... Akron, New York, and the few Clevelanders was chosen as the way out. But in the Library of Congress, we found that there were 12 books by the name of the way out. So for heaven's sake, we couldn't make a 13th, so it became Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> you know, Bill, if we'd have gotten our way in Akron, we'd have T-shirts today saying the way outers. So I'm kind of glad it's, uh, that didn't happen. Wow, we see that big red book there, and that's because they had a special on um, red that day. Then we went up to the digest and said, now what about this piece? Uh, we're all ready to shoot. And the editor to whom we had talked vaguely remembered us, and he said, shoot what? Oh, Bill. Oh, that was really scary. Well, what did you do? Well, we reminded uh, our friend that the piece would do, and he said, gee, Mr. Wilson, he said, we... You know, after you were here, uh, uh, I went to the rest of the staff here very sure that this would be a great piece. Uh, but they didn't think so, and I forgot to tell you. We feel your pain. I just heard a moan go through the room. Yeah, you were really counting on that, Bill, and you had the, uh, almost 5,000 big books printed up, and uh, you don't even have 100 guys sober. Um, so that had to be really a blow. So we had 5,000 books in the warehouse. There were 100 AA members. There were about 30 stockholders, and they each got a book. There were, there, <laughs> there were about 30 guys who put stories in the books, and they each got a book, and that was 60 books. So we only had 40 books to sell the rest if they'd buy it. <laughs> well, I know that a real tough time came upon you and Lois. Tell us about that. Well, at that time, things folded up in a big way. We were about to be evicted from our house in Clinton Street, stuff going to storage. The book was bankrupt, and we made one last great gasp effort. What was that? A drunk came along by the name of Morgan, who had been in the ad business, and he said, you know, I know Gabriel Heater. You know, the guy who puts on those wonderful sob talks. And he said, I think Gabriel would put this on the air. So we scared up a few dollars more. And to get ready for Gabriel, we decided... <laughs> 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 well, we can't wait to find out what's so funny, Bill. What did you do to get ready for Gabriel? Well, we picked out a hard class of people to advertise to in those days. We picked out all of the physicians east of the Mississippi, Mississippi River, all of them. And to each one, we sent a postal card, which said, 
Listen to Gabriel Heater as he talks about the new society of Alcoholics Anonymous. And buy the book Alcoholics Anonymous, a cure for alcoholism. Wasn't there a problem with Morgan Ryan? Well, one great trouble with Ryan was that he wouldn't sober up and he was supposed to be interviewed on the air. <laughs> God, our last cent was in this thing and all these puzzle cards. Well, how did you handle that situation? So, just as a precaution, one of our friends who was a member of the Down Athletic Club said, well, now, uh, you, you can have my room over there. I don't use it much. And why doesn't somebody live with Morgan in there the week before, you know, to just stay with him and be sure he gets the heater all right? <laughs> uh, that was definitely before Alan. Um, did that? Did that work for you? So the great day came. The postal card was out in Akron, New York, Cleveland. The ears were to the radio. We visioned the books going out in carloads, orders flooding in. The biggest profit of all in direct mail, no commissions. And sure enough. Peter pulled out the tremolo stop. Ryan was sober. And boy, we were made. Well, you were so glad it came off, and you held back. You and Ruth and Hank waited three days to go to the post office. Tell us about that. Oh, uh, I, I want to just read this little caption that I just added here. The broadcast was made at a time when AA and the big book effort was $10,000 in debt with only $500 left in the bank. We gave a post office box, old 458 in New York, I think it was, where we had a one-room office. Little Ruthie Hawk, who helped me with the book, bless her soul, my promoter friend Hank Parkes and I just couldn't wait to get over to see what was coming into that box. You even took suitcases. Um, and I think when you got there, you were a little disappointed. How about Hank? Hank was an incorrigible optimist. He said, well, he could, they couldn't put them all in the box. He said they got several mailbags full out there. <laughs> The clerk came with the cards. Hank said, ain't there any more? No. We took them over to the desk and we counted them. And there were 12. <laughs> and 10 of them were from doctors, obviously stewed themselves, <laughs> who lambasted the hell out of us. And we had exactly two orders for the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill, we just moaned again. I've never had quite an audience feel for you this way, but um, uh, here in Philadelphia, they get you. Um, so would you sum up that experience for us? For us, almost more than any other society, pain has been the touchstone of our spiritual progress. So we can say, thank God that we have suffered such pain, that such a spectacle as this has been brought into view and being. Hey, Bill, goodbye. Say hello to Dr. Bob for us. Nineteen sixty five Akron. Um, all right, so now you're looking at the very first big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Notice to the right that is called that's the first jacket. Imagine walking down the street with that big book and that yellow and red and you know, God, it couldn't be anonymous with that. There's another early jacket. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit on account of we're running out of time. Um 
The very first big book was Bill's coming off the press. He said this was the very first AA book off the press. We used thick paper to make the alcoholic think they were getting their money's worth. <laughs> and I got to ask you, have you gotten your money's worth out of that book? I sure hope so. It's still a pretty good deal, isn't it? And then let me just share uh, what he writes to Lois. Um, in whose loving care and fortitude in our dark days together made the pages possible. So to her, this first book of the first edition is lovingly and thankfully given. Bill, I have five minutes. <laughs> so we're going to go quick. i got to tell you this story, even if, we get, if the rest gets cut off. Uh, they, have enough, they don't have any more money. They're broke. And they're going to get a magazine article in the Liberty Magazine. And they go to the... Uh, uh, Bertha Taylor's got a tailoring shop on Fifth Avenue, and they ask him for money. And I just showed you the tailoring shop. They actually used to have meetings there. He said, I can't. So he calls Mr. Cochran. He says, Mr. Cochran, we'll sell you the big book. We'll give you a dollar off if you'll put them in libraries. He asked to see our books. We send it, our financial records to him. He looks at them. He says, I don't think so. And um, Bertha Taylor says, um, will you loan me the money? And uh, to get us to this article, and he says, yes, Bert, I will. And Bert hawked his business to get us to some press. And that is the first article, Alcoholics and God, came out September 30th of 1939. Uh, Rockefeller's going to hold a dinner for us. He's going to invite a lot of distinguished guests and bankers. And I'm not going to tell you all of them, but I will tell you that they put an alcoholic at every table with these distinguished guests. And... Um, uh, Morgan Ryan was at that table, that guy that did the radio show, and one of the bankers looked at him and he said, um, and what institution are you with? And he said, well, I'm not really with an institution, but I just got out of one not too long ago. <laughs> uh, we thought we were going to get money. Uh, Nelson presided over that dinner, and uh, his father thought it was a work of goodwill, and with that, Bill says a couple billion dollars got up and walked out of the room. Uh, uh, we did get some, uh, a lot of, uh, he let, he wrote a whole bunch of letters, uh, out to his friends and gave them each a big book. Uh, Jack Alexander came along, thought we were a racket, and we turned him around because it's by attraction we promote, and we get that article in the Saturday Evening Post. And folks, that's what really, uh, got us into a solid fellowship. 6,000 inquiries came in. And we moved some of those books. So you can see that he was quite a friend of ours, and those are the canceled checks we paid Mr. Rockefeller back. Had our little office, and there's Bill sitting at Hank's desk back at Wit's End. And now, um, I love this picture. Um, I've told you kind of a hard story. They were homeless for a long time. Um, they went through a lot, a lot of hard times, and, and, you know, you felt that when everything folded up on them and they found their furniture on the curb and they had to live in cars and off the charity of people. And um, imagine what they're feeling right now as they're looking at all those books that are going to be sent out all over the world and to all the different countries that AA is in today. I just can't imagine what they're thinking. Um, and, um, you know, it reminds me to never quit uh, before the miracle. So when you're going through hard times, think of this story. Bill says in a talk he gave in Texas, it transcended the mountain and the sea and is even at this moment lighting candles in dark caverns and on distant beaches. And now I'd like you to all just kind of pause for a moment and think about this story as we go through the credits of the people uh, that I've just shared uh, in this story. Challenge yourself to remove one name and we might not be sitting here tonight. Bert T. Abby. Bill W. Lois. Hank P. Jack Alexander. Mr. Cochran. Jim Newton. Harvey Firestone, Bud, Henrietta Cyberling, T. Henry and Clarice Williams, John D. Rockefeller, Frank Amos, Albert Scott, Willard Richardson, Leonard Strong, Dr. Silkworth, Ruth Hawk, Ann Smith, 
and Dr. Bob. But all of the credit really goes to the author of this story, A Higher Power. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.